Hi everybody, welcome to 35 Fedora releases in 30 minutes. The Fedora project turned 18 just last week, so it seemed like a good time to go through our baby pictures, gawk at our awkward teenage years, and see the handsome young adult we've grown into, and also along the way reflect on what we've learned and could share from that. Now, normally I'd spend some time introducing myself, you know where I'm coming from, but um, you can find that on the internet because I have 84 slides and I intend to get through them all in time for questions. So stuff like the history of Red Hat Linux, the birth of RHEL, the short-lived Red Hat Linux project, that's somebody else's talk for another time. So here's the format. I'm going to not read the slides unless I get really nervous and start doing them by accident. Um, some things of note, screenshot in the corner there. Um, I'm listing the kernel version kind of as a reminder that we integrate a huge amount of upstream change that comes to us through no, uh, really no activity of the Fedora project ourselves. All this open source activity causes change to come to us, and a lot of our work is integrating that. Um, the events over there in the other column is basically our headline events. We actually have a whole bunch of other things that are Fedora events, Fedora Women's Day, release parties, uh, Fedora activity days, well, fads. Um, those kind of things are going on. So this is just kind of our big headline events listed there. Uh, most lists active on the develop list is mostly for fun there. Obviously, uh, the most noisy person on the develop list isn't always the most productive. And as we've grown as a project, the develop list is less of a nexus for all activity anyway. So it's more, more for fun than like this is the winner of something. But I wanted to put some names up there and seemed like a way to do it. Um, on the bottom, uh, this is basically uh, popularity of that release at its peak um, methodology for that. Again, another talk, but basically you can judge the relative popularity of each one by that. Uh, for This is coming from our mirror network stats. So for the first five, we didn't have that. So uh, we really have no good way to measure the popularity. So question marks for those. All right, here we go. Fedora Core 1. Flowers in a pond here. It's a nice quiet beginning. So Fedora Core 1 was really already in the works inside of Red Hat, and as far as I know, it was released with basically the same mechanisms, mechanisms that would have been used for making uh, Red Hat Linux. I think the plan was for it to be Red Hat Linux 10. Um, honestly, I think it was more like a 9.1. It was just a pretty decent Red Hat Linux release that happened to have the name Fedora Core on it, and Fedora Extras was an add-on collection software that the external to Red Hat community could maintain and participate in. But a key thing happened shortly after the release. Uh, there's AMD 64, 64-bit 64 Intel architecture uh, thing. Uh, it wasn't brand new, but it was still a high-end kind of systems thing, and Red Hat had been planning to reserve that as a differentiator for RHEL. It was going to be a one of the add-on value things. But a community member, Justin, went and at home rebuilt all of this stuff for 64-bit and made it available. And so apparently, I wasn't there, but uh, that caused a kind of crisis inside of Red Hat um, about what should be done with this. Should we you know, disavow it, whatever? Um, but eventually they came to the decision, hey, if this is going to be a community thing, we got to empower the community. And so that actually was a little bit later released as an official Fedora Core 1 feature, uh, which is very cool. Um, look at that tiny little Red Hat logo. Actually, a literal red hat. I find that very amusing. Okay, uh, next, Fedora Core 2. That's basically another fine release of what could have been Red Hat Linux. It looks pretty much the same. There's actually some important technical talent, technical changes under the hood. There's a 2.6 kernel that was a big deal at the time. SE Linux is enabled. Well, that's another talk. The big question here really is, what is this community stuff that people from Red Hat were talking about? What does it really mean here? The announcement, which wasn't really in the screenshot, I just put it over there for somewhere to put it, says executive producer of the open source community. But it didn't really feel like that. It was pretty clear that this director thing, Red Hat is the director, whether it's engineering, business, uh, it was opaque from the outside what exactly was going on there. Um, it felt, as an outside contributor at the time, like the Red Hat people were kind of acting uh, overly optimistic about this community rah 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 stuff, and uh, so Constantine, Mr. Icon, posted this thing, the, the famous IRC log. It's not really an IRC log. I don't know if it's even too small to read here. It's actually very long. Lots of people, when I was prepping for this talk, said you got to include that. Um, so here's an excerpt of it. Basically, 
Uh, basically, it's some pretty incisive sarcasm about how it felt like from the, from the outside, and uh, you can find it and read it, and the LWN.net discussion comments on that are also actually really interesting. But behind the scenes, Red Hat folks were really trying. There was just kind of a lot of fear about this new RHEL model and worry that having Fedora succeed might undermine RHEL. We know now that that fear was unwarranted. Um, Fedora success is great for RHEL, but it took a while for that to happen. And uh, so the first Fedora project leader, Michael Johnson, actually was, I was talking to him and he was really discouraged by this. He actually left the project and Red Hat because he felt like he had failed the community. Uh, Michael's back around Fedora some now. Um, he, didn't, he didn't fail, it just took a long time for it to be realized. Three. So the announcement for this one says the Fedora project and Red Hat would like to announce. So it's progress, it's not just Red Hat announces. But Core was still, still really all Red Hat. But there's some stuff happening. Um, the Fedora Extras packages, instead of actually being on the old Fedora.us separate server, were actually now available from the same server. Um, but they weren't built in a centralized build process. In fact, it was perfectly manual. It was send your spec file to Seth Fidal, one of the early community contributors. But uh, look how many packages there are. It's a four times growth in packages in that. So people were people were getting involved and interested. Stuff was happening. It just wasn't quite what we wanted. Fedora Core 4, this is the only time we repeated wallpaper. <sighs> this release was the worst. Uh, it really, it took <laughs> forever to show up. And, you know, we we're still community folks were waiting on Red Hat secret processes for it to happen. SE Linux is still a huge mess. Reviews at the time said that uh, it clearly uh, prioritized features over stability. And actually, after that release, it got worse. There was an update partway along that actually broke upgrading completely, like you couldn't update your system anymore. It was just hot mess. Um, but there was actually also a lot of great community stuff going on. We had our first Fedora conference, FUDCon, Fedora User and Developer Conference, a little joke there in the name. Uh, it really brought us all together. I helped organize that at Boston University, so I'm really biased, but I think it was a huge success. And particularly, it didn't feel like it was Red Hat people coming to tell us what's what. It felt like a collaborative thing where we could all work together and everybody who cared about it could actually be involved and do things. Um, yeah, um, there are lots of new packages and stuff going on. Uh, one of the really important things is we got a, kind of a real community governance with a thing called FESCO, Fedora Engineering Steering Committee, and crucially, Torsten Leemhaus, who is the first chair of that committee, set an example that's lived with us in Fedora ever since, which is rather than looking for a majority vote on decisions, we look for consensus. Yeah. What is consensus is really a whole talk on its own, but it isn't that we have to get everybody to agree, but it's that everybody has a voice, everybody who is invested in it uh, feels like they're heard and they're willing to go forward with something for the sake of the community. And it's a really important process. You know, that's how Fedora tries to work on all of our decision making. And this is the core of the whole open organization thing, the open source, the open decision making process. All well, that came from the Fedora community and really had a big impact on you know, how we do things in Fedora and on Red Hat and I think uh, culture at large in open source. I'm really fond of this background. I, the fancy new logo and the bubbles, it always felt like so designery to me. Uh, the big news in this release is Yum. So Yum was a tool for managing uh, RPM package dependencies, software updates, uh, basically you know, installing software without getting into RPM dependency hell, RPM hell as people called it at the time. So Red Hat internally had a thing they were working on uh, up to date Red Hat network and they invested quite a lot in it, but Yum was just better. And so uh, after again, some soul searching, Red Hat admitted that and switched to having Yum be the default thing here. Um, another fun thing that happened is the Fedora Core 5 release day broke the Red Hat corporate network and it was like end of quarter or something and nobody could get their work done. Um, so that was fun and uh, Mike McGrath, who was community person, actually head of the Fedora infrastructure at the time, working on Fedora Extras stuff and everything, uh, was quickly hired into the company and told to make sure that that never happened again. Um, He's the VP of Linux Engineering now at Red Hat, so I, I guess it work, worked out. Um, 
And of course, we have our now classic logo here. This, uh, this the Fedora brand, I'm sorry, the Red Hat brand team came up with this, and the slogan "Infinity Freedom Voice" was something that that team invented. Um, yeah. Um, there's a lot of community love for this next wallpaper too. It's so fancy with the 3D. Um, so, uh, this release came out on my daughter's, my second daughter's birthday. So I don't remember much about it personally. Uh, it's still taking way too long between releases. Uh, there's a whole story about the Fedora Foundation. Um, no time for details on that, but we had to find another way to make sure that there was real community governance. And so the Fedora board came out of that. Um, it's before there was a thing called the advisory board, but that was really just a mailing list where anybody could chip in and you know advise. It wasn't really a governance body and it didn't really mean anything. Um, so now it's real. It had a mix of elected members and some appointed by the Fedora project leader, and the Fedora project leader actually had a veto power. That veto power has ne was never used, but it was always there as a thing. And look, uh, mirror manager system, so we can actually get a count of installed systems. That bar doesn't mean anything much by itself, but you can see the relative values as we go. Okay, no more core. There's just one Fedora project. That split, core and extras, turned out to be causing more pain than it than it helped, both for the, obviously the people outside of Red Hat who couldn't contribute to core, but also people inside of Red Hat who was really, really frustrating. So there was a lot of work to do all of this. And it turned out, rather than giving external community members access to core, it turned out to be easier to just export all of core into extras. So actually, um, really core was basically dissolved and Fedora Extras, the community side thing, became the, the one Fedora Linux. This was also the first release with live images, tried before you buy. Um, at Apple, extra packages for Enterprise Linux, yes, uh, that started at the FUDCon in Boston. Um, and there's this new fancy file system we talked about at that FUDCon, um, and we kind of decided, well, maybe in a year or two that'll be ready. Um, Put put a pin in that. We'll we'll come we'll come back to that. Um, so, Fedora Seven brought Core and Extras together, but this is where it really started to feel like a community project. We introduced a features process for planning, doing all the planning, what was going into it in the public. Um, this release was really very popular. I know that there actually are at least a hundred systems out there uh, still checking in for Fedora Eight updates in case we ever produce a security update for them. Um, and also, this idea for Fedora spins came out, the idea that um, we don't just make one OS for everybody, but rather tailor offerings for specific user needs. That started here, and I think that is kind of essential to what makes Fedora special as a distro. Uh, the Electronic Lab was the first of these, but we have a whole bunch of them that had a bunch over the years. Um, Sulfur, uh, this release, um, yeah, we had a lot of features. One of the key things here, um, the system five init scripts, init scripts that you know get your system from kernel starts up to actually having other processes and running, running a real running system. That old system was buggy, inconsistent, slow, and not really well adapted to modern hardware. So at FUDCon, someone stood up and said, my name is Casey Dolan. I'm going to replace Fedora's init system. If you want to stop me, come to my talk. Uh, Casey was an intern at Red Hat, but not on the operating system side of things. He was working at IT, in IT, so really he was just an enthusiast community uh, member, and he wanted to make things better, and he did. So again, you know, community-led improvements made real big changes. Uh, now uh, we get to the origin of the Fedora Foundations. Remember the earlier Infinity Freedom Voice slogan? It came from the Red Hat brand team, and it really felt, especially to FPL, Max Spivak, and but others, um, that we needed to have something that really came from the community, that resonated with the community. So there was a lot of work and came up with Freedom Friends features first, which we still use, um, not just in marketing, but kind of to, to guide our decisions. Like these are the Fedora values in more than just a superficial corporate marketing kind of way. Also trivia, Cambridge was going to be the code name for Red Hat Linux 10 before that was canceled, so it was fun for people to bring that back for Fedora 10. This was a special version of this wallpaper um, that was for if you had it spanning across two monitors, 
Um, and the lion only appears on the second monitor, so it's kind of an Easter egg. I never saw this at the time because I didn't have two monitors, but um, yeah. Um, around this time, Mo Duffy sketched these iconic graphics for the uh, four foundations. We also still use those today. And uh, we looked at ButterFS and decided it might, just in a couple more years, it would be ready for it to be the default file system. Um, so I'm going to go kind of fast through the next few releases here. Uh, here we had the first FUDCon in South America. All in all, I remember this to be a pretty boring release, but in a nice way. Uh, here we actually launched a beautiful new website. There was a marketing plan that kind of put together what a new nice website for Fedora would look like. Um, ironically, this screenshot I've chosen here shows the wiki rather than that. I'll fix this in the next version of this talk. Um, an important thing happened is work started on Copper, which is our, basically our repository for uh, an easy to add to repository for packages that don't necessarily have the polish that go into Fedora Linux itself, it's like PPAs or AUR, that kind of thing. It's a very dramatic wallpaper. Um, behind the scenes here, uh, Release Engineering, Ms. Jesse Keating, uh, switched our build system over from CVS to distgit, which is a git repositories that also have a look aside cache for binary tarballs. There's a whole other talk about that too, um, and how the future of that, what the future of that should look like. Uh, anyway, look at the nice growth trend, those bars along the bottom, they're going up and up and up. Really, things are going really well. And look, the wallpaper for this release is so lovely. This is going to be great, right? Uh oh, um, so goodbye to half of our users, not making that up. Um, there's not enough time to discuss the actual virtues of these systems, but I think by this time, it's been clear that you know, System D, GNOME 3, those are actually very popular and widely used across almost all Linux distributions. But, uh, and we worked really hard to try and manage this change. I actually went back and looked at some of the documentation from the time. We had video tutorials. It just wasn't enough. Uh, this was just too much change to dump on people all at the same time. Um, so it was the right technical call, but um, not a good way to land it. We didn't manage it well. So this wallpaper reference to Jules Verne, of course, but I can't help but feel that the overall project feeling of navigating our way through murky depths kind of came out in the designers as they were making this. And so sort of, uh, it's, we were feeling a little depressed. Uh, Jared Smith, who is the Fedora project leader at the time, calls this our awkward teenage years. But there's actually really one important good thing that happened here. Up until this point, Red Hat had required a CLA, a license agreement, to contribute to Fedora. Uh, that was dropped in favor of a thing called FPCA, which is just basically guarantees that uh, you have the rights to what you're working on and that it's under some open source license. So it's not a unilateral Red Hat um, advantage thing. It's a everybody benefits um, thing. And we're actually working on now figuring out how to um, make it so in some places we don't even require that. We just use you know, explicit permissions and things. Um, lawyers are talking. Um, we decided that ButterFS might need a couple more years. Um, next release, it can't all be murky depths, right? Uh, so the mustard indicates progress. Uh, Beefy here has been an unofficial mascot of Fedora for a long time. And as you can see, fans were not afraid of bending the alleged process for arriving at a release name to make sure that they won here. Uh, so many people, when I talk to them, describe this as their favorite release. And, you know, it, it was an awkward teenage years release. It wasn't necessarily a great technical release, but just that energy from this name kind of buoyed people and the positive connection, it just uh, made people feel good about being in the Fedora community, even when things were tough to have this kind of fun. So I understand why people really have fond memories of that time. Uh, on this wallpaper, those dots are actually spheres. They're idealized spherical cows in some physics experiment. Um, this release also kind of a mess. Uh, the installer code base had grown really horrible and it needed some fixing, but our feature process was just kind of a aimed at each release, and this was something that needed to be, more, took more time than six months to do. Um, we ended up slipping from our October target all the way around to January to even produce something that was functional, 
And uh, at the time, at almost the very last minute, we realized, oh, it doesn't even have a way to do upgrades. So Will Woods very quickly wrote a thing called Fed Up, which is one of my favorite names of anything, um, that does did upgrades in a, in a different manner and actually turned out to be the start of us, a much improved Fedora upgrade process, but it was kind of a painful way to get to that. We also had a lot of frustration with release engineering. Uh, one person had been doing a lot of the work and because of that, a lot of the knowledge and just a lot of the access had fallen onto his shoulders and it wasn't his fault. It's kind of a natural thing to happen. Uh, he was doing a lot of heroic work and getting burned out and frustrated and people were frustrated with him. Uh, and yeah, that was hard and it actually took us a long time to figure out how to straighten that out. We've done, it's a much better arrangement now, but um, it was, yeah, we had to make some big structural changes to change that. Um, ButterFS again. Uh, this wallpaper, there, there are boxes for the cat to hide in, you see? Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, around this time frame, people were getting, again, pretty despairing about the path. All the up and downs were not good. Um, and there was rumors that there was some deal to bring CentOS into the company. Uh, what would that mean for Fedora? Were people intending to replace Fedora with CentOS? Pretty scary. Uh, but the biggest thing here was really this immense tragedy Seth Vidal, who I mentioned earlier, um, was killed when he was biking and by a hit-and-run driver. And Seth was a giant in the Fedora community. He would have, he would have been, he's very humble and he would have downplayed that, but he really was. Uh, not just in the technical things, but I, when he and I were both university sysadmins, he helped convince me that it was worth it, all of this work to give back and contribute into the community and act in the community. That was the benefits you got from that were, were worth it. And so Seth was just so important. He was kind, he was funny, he was brilliant. Uh, he was a dear friend and we miss him a lot. Uh, so, uh, wallpaper here, XX for 20. Uh, this one had so much going on, it couldn't fit it all in. Um, I had a picture of myself with the 10 years of Fedora shirt that I'm wearing here. I decided to cut it. Those badges over there are not in the screenshot. But we got to the 10 year mark here and we decided we needed to do some strategic planning. We'd started out great at the beginning of the project, um, but we've been in this kind of long slump. So what could we change so that the next five years would be better and so we'd be set up for the next 10 years of Fedora to be growth rather than you know, going up and down again. So the flock to a Fedora event was key here. Uh, the FUD cons, which we've been having around the world, were not really working anymore. Um, there was, it was not enough of the right people all in the right place. People who were in the South America, Asia, away from kind of the engineering nexuses or in um, Czech Republic and East Coast US kind of felt like they were left out of things. It didn't felt second class. So we had this idea to make a one global conference where we bring everybody to and do planning. And uh, it was Robin Bergeron's idea and Ruth Seeley, Tom Calloway kind of made, made this happen. Um, so this was a really good event where we did a lot of this planning. Um, the Fedora board at this time, it kind of faded into the background and really kind of only woke up when there was some sort of dispute about open source principles and hadn't uh, otherwise didn't, didn't really, weren't really involved in the day-to-day -day thing. So Fesco, uh, which is the older body in Fedora anyways, kind of, kind of drove this strategic plan here. Um, the Fedora rings thing um, still isn't quite realized, although I can see some of it actually in RHEL, um, but also this uh, Fedora additions idea that instead of producing just these random Lego blocks, we're going to focus on making sure that we've got, you know, assembled Lego sets that people can start playing with right away. It's again, it goes back to that thing from eight with the spins, like this is kind of a Fedora thing, but we wanted to really make sure those things were polished and really nice for users. So the excitement around this really, like it took off, it clicked in the media and users, and some of this, you know, GNOME 3 and System D had actually matured, maybe they, the, they were ready for the world at this point, but whatever the reason is, this really was a very popular release. Uh, but also, um, you notice it took 168 days to make that. That's not very long. That's way too short. And our QA team was feeling pretty burned out by doing that. The release engineering, like I said, was feeling even worse. Uh, and then as a project, we're asking for more polish and on more things. So we decided to stop the presses and actually wait, skip a release, do a whole year to get ready for the next Fedora release things. 
Uh, so, one year later, first of all, code names are fun, but as you can kind of see from the process, they were getting very silly, and it was actually taking us a lot of lawyer time to find one that was uh, approved and made sense and everything. So we decided to drop them. Josh Boyer says we can blame him for that, but really a lot of people were ready ready to move on. Um, so as part of this, we designed Git Fedora as a user-targeted brochure site. It was meant to go hand in hand with a thing called Fedora Hubs. The problem I felt at the time was that we had so much activity in the project. We had 1,100 IRC meetings every year uh, and a huge amount of IRC chat and then a lot of mailing list traffic. But mailing lists aren't really visible in the modern universe. And so Fedora Hubs was kind of going to uh, basically surface all that as a Fedora uh, contributor gateway. And uh, for various reasons, probably also another talk um, that never launched, but we'll get back to some of those ideas later. Um, I think 4,096 days since the project launched is a nice round number. Uh, 22. So I mentioned that the board didn't feel like it was really working. It wasn't just that they weren't active, um, but they didn't feel connected to the project. At Flock in Prague, we are talking about the additions plan, which some people were still skeptical of, um, and they didn't even know that the board had approved this plan. Like, is this official? What's going on? And in fact, we'd gone through quite a lot of work to get the board to approve it, and nobody even really knew. Uh, so I came up with a new structure, um, which the board eventually unanimously approved, Fedora Council, designed to be a more active leadership and also to connect all the different various groups um, who I, I made a map on the board of like 40 different committees and things in Fedora that really didn't talk to each other, kind of connect them all to an org chart. Uh, so active leadership and this body has a consensus model rather than a vote at all. Um, and there's no more FPL veto. Like I said, it was never used. It wasn't really necessary. And with this model, we try to find consensus from everybody, not just approval of Red Hat. Uh, the Fedora Council also manages Fedora objectives designed to span multiple releases. And also we have this thing called the FCAKE, the Fedora Community Action and Impact Coordinator. Uh, that's basically what a community manager might be. Um, another project, but another talk. I, I hate the word community manager. Um, another talk. Um, but uh, former FPL Robin Bergeron really fought to get this role created so that the next FPL would not burn out so quickly and um, seems to be working so far. Um, so just to change things up a bit, the screenshots from KDE, KDE Plasma Desktop, our second most popular desktop environment. Uh, we got our first diversity and inclusion advisor, a long-term time contributor from Latin America. I tried to get Red Hat to make this a fully funded paid role, but I couldn't make it happen. I still think it should be, um, but I wasn't going to let Red Hat not funding it block us from doing it in the project. If anybody else has some funding or anything they'd like to do, um, talk, talk to me about this. I'd like to make this happen. Uh, other cool technical stuff for uh, Fedora Atomic Host based on RPM OS tree, a sort of Git-like approach to the operating system. And people kept asking for Fedora to be a rolling release or an LTS, one of those. And that's weird to me because those are so different on the spectrum of what you can do. Um, but the commonality really to me is that upgrades are scary to people. So we decided to work on that fundamental problem and work on making upgrades really smooth, which has also has been very successful. Um, this is the XFCE, XFCE spin. Um, we had some marketing initiatives around this time that were kind of a minor success. Uh, Fedora loves Python, but um, this isn't funded by Red Hat Marketing. Red Hat Market does, puts their marketing dollars into product, which is understandable. Um, and so we've had some community people here with the expertise, but it tends to be kind of lonely. And so it's something that really kind of needs help. And also, uh, similarly, our docs team lead around this time, um, kind of the team had just naturally trickled down to one person and then he got a day job and this is a case of someone doing so well we took them for granted. I'm not really proud of that but it's a lesson learned. We try to make sure that doesn't happen. Uh, we still do need help in the docs team here. Oh. So uh, yeah uh, people really liked this one. We got a lot of good press. Um, it was encouraging to those of us who had been really feeling like we were you know lived through the teenage years. Uh, we 
where finally things are definitely on the up here, like the huge jump. Um, screenshots from the cinnamons bin here. This one might be my favorite wallpaper. Um, I like a lot of them, but I really love this one, uh, not just because of the result here, which is beautiful, but the process, which was very community back and forth and built on it. Um, it's actually a voice print of someone saying Fedora. Um, contrary to popular belief, it is not me. It was the designer, Kyle, who said that, but it's very cool. Um, we got a new mission statement around this time, and this mission statement, basically, we make an OS that runs a lot of places and we enable our community to make solutions for users, um, is, is really calling back to that thing from Fedora 8 with the, the making spins and making all these different kind of things. Uh, we, make, um, not, we make a bunch of building blocks, but we also make these pre-assembled sets. Uh, modularity, um, how that went and is going, again, its own talk. It's really difficult to make things that span multiple releases, especially when they're big changes. Uh, we got MP3 support. Also, um, the, the trick was to wait out all the patents, so that's not really a great process. Um, so, um, the last release was eight months long again. Um, we decided that this time we were not going to delay. We were going to make a very short release because otherwise it was going to be a very strong risk of uh, going around into January again. Um, at this flock, I was pretty despairing. Um, it wasn't because of the short time, it was because modularity was pretty rough. Um, hey look, Squirrel, um, what's this over here in the other corner? This is sugar on a stick. This is the one laptop per child um, user interface still going strong, which is cool. Um, really, I will talk about modularity some other time. It's very interesting, but um, by 28, I'm feeling a little more optimistic. Some of the modularity stuff landed, and this is actually the perfect first time we ever released on time according to our own plan. So we executed it on our schedule. And actually, we've done that ever since. But um, this was that was nice. A part of the trick was we dropped having alpha releases and made sure that the Rawhide development tree was you know, up to the quality that we'd formerly called alpha. Um, we also had that same story about the docs team happen in our webs team, website team, where one person had kind of become essential and um, you know it's, it's not his fault this is a prop a project process fault where uh, when he got another job uh, things kind of fell apart there um, this is a happier story here because we now have a really nice website synapse team that's very active and involved but it took a while to get back around to that uh, this wallpaper is also amazing um, the beginning of this year Red Hat surprised everybody by buying CoreOS the company uh, that deal was almost entirely about OpenShift and Kubernetes, and that meant where did uh, the thing called CoreOS, Container Linux, briefly, where would that land? I fought to make a home for that in Fedora. I think it's a great fit, and it's going to be uh, continue to be good going forward. I'm glad we were able to find a place for them. Uh, Fedora Silverblue is a desktop environment based on the same ideas as Fedora Atomic Host and um, now CoreOS. Um, you, in order to make a Fedora spin, like it doesn't have to be just a configuration of packages or trivial changes, you can make something you know, that's actually kind of radically different. Yeah, another fine release. I'm looking at the clock. Let's move on. Okay, here there's plenty of stuff, but the highlight is we uh, Lenovo shipped laptops with Fedora Workstation pre-installed, actually behind the lectern here. That's what I've got running right now. Availability out of the box is the number one blocker to widespread desktop Linux, and uh, you know we're working to change that. The awesome thing I think is Lenovo came to us. They said our customers want Fedora running on our laptops. What can we do? And they really wanted to do everything the right way. This is an entirely open source Fedora operating system with no modifications from Lenovo. They are really awesome to work with. Uh, there have been some supply chain problems during the COVID times, but um, we have some more awesome stuff coming up on this, too. Um, so, COVID times. Since we couldn't do Flock to Fedora, we had Nest with Fedora instead. And I was really dreading this because I'm tired of virtual meetings already. And Flock has always been an essential recharge for me, getting together in person with people. Uh, so I was not happy about having to do this virtually, but it actually turned out to be awesome. Um, we did a really good job. People came together, had a lot of fun, and it was really, it's still the best virtual event. Sorry, this event. 
um, but best virtual event I've been to. Um, I, I loved it and I really got that energizing spark from it again. So um, that was a lot thanks to Marie, who's our FK now, uh, but also to the whole community. And also, um, we looked at ButterFS and decided, okay, let's do it. Um, and, and we did it. So there we go, after all, this, all these slides. Um, this is our nice COVID wallpaper. There's also a nice evening version of it with fireflies. Kind of a escape the world relaxing wallpaper. Uh, this is the best release we've made so far until next month. Um, GNOME 40 is a big hit. It's uh, also the first thing that has a lot of big change since GNOME 3. Um, and this time, the GNOME project kind of learned their lessons on that and did a huge amount of use or research going in and ensured it paid off. Um, I know some people prefer their workspaces going the other way, but most people, like, this has been a really good release. Um, and look, we've got a new logo. This continues from the other one, but uh, modernizes the look and solves some technical problems and some other things with it, and I really like it as well. Um, and finally here, the release parties. We did a virtual release party kind of focusing. Um, Flock was very contributor focused, and we kind of lost a, a user audience conference, and the release parties um, online turned out to be a way we can kind of talk and connect with new and potential Fedora users about, about what we're doing and what's new and what's exciting. So we're going to keep doing those because that was a really big success. Uh, note that the peak of the blue line hasn't been reached yet. That'll keep going up until Fedora 35 comes out. Um, so uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, and this isn't the final wallpaper yet. It's the beta wallpaper. There's still some tweaks, but here we go. Uh, screenshots from this laptop showing the GNOME 41 overview. And beta release of this is tomorrow, so a little plug for that. Uh, the big question is, can we keep up the 182 days apart schedule? Um, I think so. Oh, we're on track. Um, we look to the future a little bit here. We're working on some important things. I talked about the Fedora Hubs thing before. We're still trying to find ways to surface that activity. We're doing a website redesign, and as part of that, our new chat server, which is based on Matrix, is going to be kind of integrated into our new website design. Um, and so that will kind of all that active discussion will be part of our visible presence, basically. And it's not just tech. We've got a new Fedora Ambassadors program. We're really hoping to reach out and really grow the project over the next few years. We also have a program management team. This is that thing about trying not to burn out one person. Ben Cotton is our awesome program manager, um, but he wants to make sure that not everything falls on just him, which is good. And it also provides a team that can be a flywheel of sorts to other teams. They can help keep the process things going in the, in the docs team, marketing websites, and so on, um, without that becoming a burden to people as well. So that's a really nice thing that we made. So now we're caught up. Um, some quick distilled lessons here. You have to find a balance when you're making big changes. Uh, docs are you know essential, but they're not enough. You've got to be able to explore things and you've got to you know be able to mess up and try new things and try different directions. Yeah. Um, kind of the natural state of volunteer teams to drift apart and for that things to fall on one person. Um, so Ben Cotton came up with this flywheel theory term. Um, you don't need to make sure that someone is there to do all the things. You need to make sure that someone is there to keep those team processes flowing and to enable the community around that to do those things. That's the most important thing. Um, related to that on kind of an individual level, you got to make sure you take care of people in the project and watch when things are not going well. Letting go of control might be the hardest work to do. And you might ask, you know, if I let go of this, if I let make, let, if I go all in on real community, like a real community open source, how will I make money? Well, I think Red Hat and Fedora show that you can be very successful, even commercially, and still also let, let your open source project really thrive as an open source project. And in doing that, you can make something that's awesome and goes beyond just the money as well. All right, and there we go. I'm gonna stop and take a drink of water and take your questions. If anyone has them. Yes. Do I continue to plan on being the Fedora whatever my role is? Uh, Fedora project leader. Um, 
I, I'm still enjoying it, and I feel like there's some things I set out to do when I started that are not done. Um, you know, I it, it just like the it can't all be one person forever. It shouldn't be me forever, but um, I I feel like I'm having fun with it and doing a good job. So um, for for the foreseeable future, I'm I'm still in. Plus, I really want to do some Fedora travel. So let, let's get past COVID and let me travel the world again as Fedora project leader for sure. David, do do one at a time so I can repeat the question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the question was, will Adam Williamson return to being the heaviest email list contributor? Yeah, um, if you've been watching that along the time, sometimes he was both the top first poster and the top reply person. Yeah, um, so I, I, I don't know. Uh, I think uh, Adam is a QA team community monkey, as he describes himself, I think. Um, and I, I think he probably will at some point, but um, we also need to make room for other people besides Adam to be the QA people we depend on for everything, part of, part of that lesson. And so, uh, yeah, so is Adam no longer being the top poster all the time um, indicative of a QA complication? I think that's... Um, indication of Adam getting a little bit older and a little more relaxed, but still a very prolific poster in all sorts of places and also a great, wonderful person. Uh, over, yeah. Yeah, um, question, the question is, um, is Fedora Project going to move to GitLab? Um, it is uncertain exactly what we're going to do. We do have GitLab license available to us. There's part of the same thing that brought um, Red Hat's using it and uh, CentOS Stream is using GitLab. Um, so I think uh, right now a lot of the project is distributed across all sorts of Git forges. We've got stuff on our own Pegger and we have a lot of things on, on GitHub and so on. And I think we are, we are certainly going to at least make that GitLab that is available to us available for people to use. Um, you know, I talked about going all in on open source. Um, GitLab is an open core company and they don't provide an all open source hosted version. And for a lot of people, for the actual disk git of hosting the source packages themselves, it felt really important that that infrastructure be all open source as well. So we're still figuring out what that's going to look like. More questions? Surely there are some. Wow. Yeah. The comment was um, run the uh, every release I've talked about on various systems, netbooks, and ThinkPads, and so on, and just the difficulties of trying to get vendors on board. So yeah, um, really Lenovo has been a joy to work with. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah, uh, how can we convince people that it's worth ordering, w waiting for and ordering the versions that come with Linux out of the box? Uh, you know, because it is 
only a restricted set of models and things, it's, it's pretty, it, it's hard. Um, you know, people need, need the systems that they want, but you know, it really, like, like I said, this came from people who cared about it asking Lenovo and saying, we want this. So, you know, keep asking Lenovo and get your company to ask Lenovo or whoever else, Dell, Asus, whoever, <laughs> all the other laptop manufacturers, you know, talk to them and tell them about your need. Um, as for you know, how can we convince users, um, you know, I, I don't know if we really need to lecture users into it, but just making people aware that this is really the easiest way. If you want a system preset up, they are available to use the best that I know. Sorry, I don't have magic for that one. David again. Yeah, well, so I think um, I said several of the times, I think, again, right at the beginning, the 64-bit thing was was really huge. Um, then this the core, core Extras merge, where Core had been you know, this thing that was developed under all Red Hat planning inside, and then bringing that all out and saying, you know, anybody, anybody in the project, you don't have to be a Red Hatter, you can actually be a committer to our kernel, to libc, to all these things, like it doesn't your redhat.com address doesn't matter which things you have access to. So it's been uh, just a lot of examples all throughout of that. All right, anything else? Thank you, everybody. You've been a lovely audience. Thank you, virtual audience. I'm sure you've also been a wonderful audience. I'm sorry I can't hear from you, but thank you very much.